Hi everyone in cloud computing and welcome to episode 29 of the Cloud Computing Training Show with Brad Nelson, an internationally recognized and world's number one cloud industry expert and thought leader, David Linthicum. This show is sponsored by Nelson Hilliard, cloud computing recruitment specialist, placing great people in cloud, IoT, FinTech and AI. In this week's show, Dave and I are talking about that a woman with late stage breast cancer came into a city hospital with fluids already flooding her lungs. The hospital's computers read her vital signs and estimated a 9.3% chance that she would die during her stay at hospital. Google's new type of algorithm read up on the woman's data, which was 175,639 data points, and rendered its assessment of her death risk at 19.9%. She actually passed away in a matter of days. Make sure you stay until the end of the show to get David's top three tips. Hi, Dave. It's great to see you on another cloud computing training show. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, this is a <clears throat> this is kind of a, a sad one, but it's something that I think we need to address because I mean, there's lessons learned here uh, that we need to get into in terms of um, machine learning and its capabilities to do a better job in situations specifically like this when someone's life is at risk. And we probably needed to raise the alarm a little higher in this case. And uh, you know, Google had the answer, but you know, there's lots of tuning that needs to be done to these things. So this is about training the computers, which is kind of a new take on what we've been talking about. Yeah, it really is. And, and it is sad. And, and I, just reading it myself, it just it, it brought a lump to my throat, to be honest with you. And it, it really gives you an insight into how things can be missed and what opportunities can be missed, not just from, you know, the, the, the closing stages of life, but also, you know, throughout your entire life what are the computers picking up on that we're not so perceptive of at the moment so i think it's it holds a, a poignance me with when when loss of life is taken too young and also at a latter stage when there's you know if you are old enough and you get cancer etc that you know it really is um yeah i think it's a difficult time for everyone i think you're right with the the computer training it, it's going to make a, a big difference a huge difference the with the next generation we're going in i mean i thought i think it's uh the other week uh, a company has, has reprinted a uh, 3d printed part of a rib cage, which is another topic altogether that we, we can talk about at a later stage. But moving, staying on topic, because this is a, a strong topic for me, are, are we entering a new era, do you think, where we need to train computers, Dave? Yeah, I think so. Look at this situation here. I mean, they had the, originally the hospital's uh, computing system, which probably was not machine learning based, not AI based, uh, came up with a 9.3% chance that she would die during the stage. And then Google probably with better algorithms and many different and many more data points. They had 175,639 data points and rendered its assessment of her death would be 19.9. And ultimately they were right. She passed away in a matter of days. And I think that um, not that this would have saved her life, um, not, not faulting the hospital at all, but the reality is we, if we're going to put assessments on people's, um, you know, the, the risk that they're going to die, we have to be very accurate with those assessments, you know, more so than whether a car is going to blow up or not and things like that. And I think we're basically putting the same machine learning algorithms to failure of equipment, to failure of bodies. And I don't think that needs to be the case. And so the reality is that machine learning unto itself does not create knowledge. It creates the potential for knowledge and your ability to train a knowledge model over time is ultimately going to be the value of that knowledge model. So it wasn't necessarily that I think Google had the best algorithms here, but it was really kind of the number of data points that the thing learned over time. It's very much like a skilled doctor. Um, they experience things and therefore they're able to, through their experiences, learn how to react to certain configurations of vital signs and solving problems, even mistakes they've made in the past. And so one of the things it just tells us is that we need to really kind of create learning or training programs for these machine learning systems that we're, we're you know, releasing on humanity right now, because I think that uh, everybody assumes that just something is artificially intelligent, that it's actually going to be intelligent and that, that is meaningless. Ultimately, you have to provide the stimulus, uh, the ability for these things to learn over time. And we need to understand how to teach these systems. And, and by the way, that's something I don't think that most AI analysts and machine learning experts really kind of understand. They you know, spend so much time, you know, uh, tr uh, creating the knowledge system. They really don't think of how the knowledge system is going to absorb information and understand things over time. They just think they can put it into operation and they know it's going to get smarter over time. But the reality is these things need to be productive the day they're released. And so something that 
Google released needs to have 170,000, 75,000 data points in there so they can make smart decisions and accurate decisions and not start with one data point and then start experiencing people's death over time uh, to learn about how these things are, are actually going to go. So it's funny. It sounds like, uh, you know, there's going to be training programs for humans. And we talked a lot about that, but I think there's going to be training programs for machines, machine learning machines. Uh, which is going to be quite the, the focus over the next few or five, three to five years. And I think it's exciting, but it's also a challenge. Yeah, it, it is very much exciting. As you say, we can't afford to be getting these uh, statistics wrong with uh, life expectancy, uh, uh, regardless of what age. If we're going to put a life expectancy, we want to make sure that you know the data that's being read is, is obviously the, the correct algorithm that's going to predict a, um, a more realistic Term, albeit days and a and a ten percent difference, it, it makes a huge difference to what that person can do or, or or get out of their life still whatever they have remaining left. But it's it's interesting point. So, do you do you see that there's going to be more of um, more paperwork regards to um, technicians and medical technicians where they're going to have to feed in more information into a, an algorithm in order for creating the data points of being checked in order to that assessment to be made. Well, I think it's about sharing information amongst these knowledge engines, which is a, a bit concerning to me because I don't think we've thought through that as much as we should. So the ability to have these knowledge bases of information, these data points, and the ability to kind of fill them up with these existing data points is going to be imperative. So while they'll learn and get localized skills for how things are done at the particular hospital and locations, they should really show up with the knowledge of 10,000 experts that's already in the in the system. To do that, we have to share information. So that means gathering, in the case of healthcare, um, diagnosis, treatment, and outcomes uh, for millions of people. And so we can figure out where mistakes were made and who died from the mistakes and hurt you know certain profiles of uh, people, whether they're obese, at high blood pressure, other risk factors, treatment you know treatment programs, things like that. To really kind of come up with the best chance that we're going to have the diagnostics that are going to be meaningful. And ultimately, humans have to check this. You know, the, this woman was treated by humans. She wasn't treated by the machine learning based system. This thing was just an aid in them determining how much of a risk she was so they could basically prioritize your treatment. But ultimately, you know, we have to get these big brains, so to speak, sharing information one to another, of course, people always tell me, well, that's going to lead to, you know, uh, massive space net and the robots are going to rise up and kill us. Uh, I don't think it's going to happen. Uh, we use, that's the only way we're going to get value out of these things. So training the robots is not only training, the ability to uh, provide stimulus for these things so they can build a knowledge base, but the ability to kind of share knowledge amongst them. Yeah, absolutely. That was it. Was going to lead me on to my next question, actually, but you covered that nicely. There really is going to have to be a huge, uh, you know, a recalibration of data that's been collated or collected that's going to be able to be deciphered by these, uh, you know, machine learning uh, tools in order to to work out the best uh, synopsis or, or best conclusion for a, a, a patient's life expectancy or or healthcare package or something. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a big deal, really. But it leads us on nicely to your top three tips for this week. So that would be great if you could share your top three tips from this topic, Dave. Yeah, absolutely. So machine learning is here and we need to train computers. And as we talked about learning to share information, so it's not enough for you to, you know, create a killer machine learning based system, you know, which is basically part of this application that you're leveraging. And I think everybody's chomping at the bit to build one of those things these days because it's kind of cool new technology. It's about your ability to train them correctly. Um, you can create machine learning systems that are absolute idiots. Um, because they know nothing. And ultimately, if you're depending on the stimulation to train them over time, they're going to be idiots until they really get into the stimulation, and that's going to take too long. So the ability to kind of load these up with information to train them is going to be an imperative. It has to be on the critical, critical path if you're building one of these things. So you have to have not only a test plan, but a learning plan for how you're going to do that. Now, typically, that's not you know putting a computer in a classroom and having someone talk to it for you know, a couple of years. It's about loading information of existing data points into these systems. Keep in mind that humans still hold creative value. And so these things are going to replace certain things that humans do, but as the tactical things. Uh, so they're not going to create kind of people's creative knowledge and their ability to kind of be value that humans are. We have ability to create or innovate all these sorts of things that computers won't be able to do for quite some time. 
and try not to put them into positions where humans are going to provide better value. I've seen that happen a few times where they view these things of creative beasts and they're not. They're, they're basically tactical things that react to certain knowledge, which is basically logic that's trained over time. And they're not going to have innovative thoughts. They're just basically going to be able to problem solvers based on existing stimulus that they're going to find out. So they know that if this computer goes down when the network is in, in a certain bandwidth limitation, that uh, this certain outcome needs to be uh, figured out and they need to go correct this particular problem. And so they can tell us those sorts of things, but they can't tr tell us how to create the next generation network and how all this stuff is gonna work. That's still in the realm of humans. You can't expect too much from ML, at least in the next five years. Um, so while I don't mind it making predictions in terms of my uh, uh, likelihood of dying if I go into a hospital, if it, certainly if it's accurate, and so they can prioritize my treatment, and uh, raise the red flags that they need to be raised, um, it's really gonna have tactical value uh, in the short term. And it really should be perceived like that. So while it can do maintenance records and it can you know, figure out the, the, predict, uh, the predictability of something failing in time, including our human bodies, um, it's not going to provide direct replacement for human beings uh, in terms of our ability to go off. Even, you know, chatbots that we leverage on every day, such as Alexa and Siri and things like that, you know, ultimately they're cool, um, but they're really kind of tactical tools. You know, tell us the weather, turn on music, um, you know, things like that. But as far as solving, you know, very complex equations and solving some of the world's problems, uh, they're not going to be there yet for a, for, for a few years. And so consider that as you start building these things. Great tips, Dave. Really great tips. A great way to end the show. So uh, I really appreciate you being part of the uh, training show this week. Thank you very much. You're welcome, man. Always a pleasure. Fantastic. And thanks for watching, everyone. We really hope you enjoyed watching this week's show, although it had a, a slight macabre uh, lilt to the training show this week. I think it is a topic that um, you know it's important that we we talk about, and we'd be would love to hear your thoughts and feelings on it as well. So I think it's touched on some very interesting topics of how machines are complementing what doctors do and, and people in the medical field do, and not necessarily taking jobs away, but just enhancing that uh, predictive life expectancy. So thanks again for watching. Remember, you can get David on Twitter, which is at David Linthicum. I'm also on Twitter, which is at Nelson underscore Hilliard. Thanks for watching and look forward to next week.